will read Psalm 16 responsively. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all other. All my delight is in the godly that are in the land, upon those who are noble among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. I will not pour out drink offerings to such gods, never take their names upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. Indeed, I have a rich inheritance. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because God is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The second reading comes from Hebrews chapter 10. Every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since, there, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us. For after saying... This is the covenant that I will make for them. After those days, said the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you're able for our gospel. Alleluia, Lord and Savior, open now your saving word. Let it burn like fire within us, speak until our hearts are stirred. Alleluia, Lord, we sing for the good news that you bring. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. It will all be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, 
Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Several years ago, a highway innovation debuted along the Garden State Parkway in New Jersey. The year was 1952, and for the first time ever, drivers who swerved outside of the lane of traffic as they drove, either inattentively or distractedly, would feel a strange rumble under their tires, and their steering wheel would tremble. Today, rumble strips are pretty standard on many stretches of highway. They're sometimes called sleeper lines or alert strips. And I don't know about you, but I can definitely say that they have probably saved me from serious injury and maybe death on several occasions as I've driven. Maybe they have helped you too, and I, I have no doubt they save many lives. And sometimes they're kind of fun, because in a few places around the world, these rumble strips are tuned to specific pitches. And as drivers drive across them, the distance between those strips and the distance of one's tires as they hit those strips create music. Here's a sample that I want to play for you. It's from Route 66, um, just in New Mexico. And if all our technology works, this should be OK. Here we go. Maybe not. Let's start that again. What you just heard was made from rumble strips in the lane this time, and I think it's kind of fun. I'm sure that the, the people try different speeds. That might not be the most safe thing to do, <laughs> but it, it's an instance of creativity with these rumble strips. And, and if you're curious, you can search on YouTube and find some samples of other roads that are, are equipped with music as well. I mentioned rumble strips because they do a few things that can help us, I think, hear God's word in our gospel today. They warn drivers of the danger of driving off the road or across the lanes. They help drivers to stay alert. And they wake drivers from sleep if they've nodded off and start to move outside of the lane. In the gospel reading that we just heard, Jesus gave a few disciples a warning, a reminder to stay alert, and a caution to avoid dozing off to sleep. Dear friends, grace, mercy, and comfort to you all from Jesus, who reveals God's graciousness, offers God's mercy, and shares the comfort of faith with each of us and with everyone else. Amen. One of the Bible scholars that I read this week wrote that Mark 13, this chapter that we heard from this morning, 
introduced what he called a fully apocalyptic Jesus. Now, the word apocalypse comes from two Greek words meaning from and cover. The word literally means to uncover. In scripture, we translate that as revelation, a revealing of something about God or about God's kingdom. Mark's Jesus, from the very beginning of the gospel, announced the imminent reign of God, that the kingdom had come. The miracles of Jesus reveal the kingdom of God. Confrontations with authorities reveal the kingdom of God. And Christ's word reveals the kingdom of God. And as we get through the book of Mark and come to chapter 13, the tone of Christ's teaching has changed. His disciples remarked about the large stones that made up the temple and other buildings, and they marveled over the ingenuity of construction. Jesus, though, was not really impressed. All of those stones, he said, will end up in a heap. They're all going to be turned. And some of his disciples privately offered a follow-up question that made perfect sense. When will this happen, they wondered. When will this happen? And Jesus didn't really answer their question. The answer does sort of come in verse 32, a little later in our chapter than where we stopped reading, when Jesus finally told his disciples that no one knows. But he used their question as an opportunity to teach them. And hearing his words today, his teaching suggested that things were about to get really bad. Being led astray will be a real danger. There will be war and earthquakes and famine. And this will be only the beginning. That's where our reading for today ends. Jesus went on to flesh out more of the details of this suffering in the rest of this chapter for his disciples. He talked about persecutions and the danger that they themselves would find themselves in. Most of it is apocalyptic boilerplate. It's very typical of apocalyptic literature from the time. Jewish apocalyptic literature had been working with themes like this and imagery and topics for several centuries leading up to the time of Jesus and the time that Mark wrote this gospel. Conservative biblical literalists who look for specific fulfillment of Jesus' prophecies in our modern age miss the point and misunderstand this genre of literature because they look at it as a prediction of, of times that can be applicable even today. And many scholars of Mark think that chapter 13 is the best place to find information to help us locate Mark's writing in the time and place of the life of the church. The reference that Mark has Jesus tell us about false messiahs and the desolating sacrilege seem to locate this gospel, scholar thinks, in the midst of a war that was happening between the Jews and Rome in Judea between the year 66 and 70 of the Common Era. And that's when we think Mark was being written. That war culminated in the destruction of the very temple that Jesus is describing in this passage being destroyed. The Jewish historian Josephus wrote about that period in his writings and corroborates the events of the day with the destruction of the temple and that war. So the idea behind this type of interpretation is that Mark provided his readers something of a clue as to when they should, they themselves should flee, perhaps to the mountains outside of town, when they should get out of town and run for a safe hiding place. When the disciples asked Jesus, when will these things take place, Jesus didn't really tell them specifically. He didn't come right out and say it. And one wonders at these passages why a full apocalyptic discourse was necessary. 
that Jesus didn't answer their question, I think should be taken more seriously. And when he does answer it a few verses later, in chapter 13, the answer is completely in the negative. Nobody knows when this will happen. And I'm not sure if that answer is helpful or not to the disciples or to us who read these words in the present time. I wonder if the disciples asked the wrong question. When they asked when, Jesus responded with a description of a world that has gone off the rails, replete with danger and betrayal and upheaval of society. The operative word, though, throughout this discourse and throughout the chapter is watch out. It appears in our reading in verse 5. It's repeated in verse 9, in verse 23, and in verse 33. And the discourse ends with a parable about a man who leaves on a journey. Jesus' charge to his disciples is the same as the charge to those of the house while the man goes away. Wakefulness and watchfulness. The story closes with the charge, stay awake, watch out, be alert. If that message is directed to a complacent community, the discourse could be a powerful theological vehicle to tell us about God's kingdom and God's self. It would suggest that God is up to stuff that may be beyond human purview that may be beyond our understanding, especially when we look at the world around us. It would mean that the community's job is simply to stay awake for it, to be alert. It functions like a rumble strip, right? It functions like a rumble strip on the side of the highway meant to jar the community awake as it nods off or drifts toward the ditch. By answering the disciples' question the way that he does, Jesus might mean that God's activity is not limited to the human sphere or to the events around us, whether they be wars or natural disasters. Mark 13, although much about human activity, is not really oriented to human actions, but, but about natural and and God's presence working in all of those things. In many ways, I think this discourse right here in chapter 13 leads nicely into the scene later in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is off praying and he asks one thing of his disciples. They simply need to stay awake, but they cannot. Apocalyptic literature is essentially about God working on behalf of humanity, and that is, in, is introduced right in the beginning of this discourse that we just heard, and it carries through the whole chapter. It leaves God alarmingly free and open to the future, because God is not limited to temporal questions like the one that the disciples ask. When? That would limit God. They could see just that point, but miss what God's doing all around them. His message to a community among, uh, who, that is living together amidst turmoil and change and transition is to watch, to stay fast, and to endure. Because God is at work. The promise of God remains through all of those things. Dear friends, two years ago, right about now, the world first learned that a new variant of a coronavirus had been discovered and was starting to spread. And since then, our world has seen a horrific pandemic, term, tumult, lives have been uprooted, changed, perhaps forever, many lost. Most people on earth have faced challenge and change and death like we've 
most of us not known before. And today's word reminds us that God is at work, still always faithful, continuing on in the midst of any danger and any turmoil that we may encounter. That was a message for his disciples. They had just entered Jerusalem with Jesus, and they knew what was going to happen in Jerusalem. Their future looked bleak. Jesus told them he would be killed and then rise, he told them what was going to happen. And his message for them was that God is still at work in all of these things and all of these dangers that we face. God is still at work. Watch. Stay fast. Stay alert. That is a message of good news for us, even these two years later, and all of the other events of our lives that can jolt us, can draw our attention off the road. We have rumble strips together that keep drawing us back. This community of faith is one of those. God's word is one of those. God's sacrament. God is always at work in all things because that is who God is. And nothing Nothing will ever separate us from the love of God that we know in Christ Jesus. Those words were true to those disciples years ago, and they are true to us today. And we live them together. Thanks be to God.